Okay, good morning folks. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you all this morning. Thanks so much for having me. I bring you greetings from the Faith Mission Bible College in Gilmerton in Edinburgh. Um, I uh, am originally not uh, from not far from here, from, uh, from Dunfermline, just down the road. Um, as someone once said to me, somebody has to be. So, um, but uh, I, growing up and, uh, and over the years I've uh, followed with, uh, with real warmth and, um, and sympathy, the Kelty hearts, uh, the real hearts, uh, you know, being the wee team because um, Cowdenbeath beat us, so we can uh, support Cowdenbeath, uh, he's relegated us. So, uh, but uh, in, in more recent years, uh, the firemen are uh, not uh, really uh, an awful lot better than Kelty, so there we are. Um, I, uh, um, I now live just outside Edinburgh, in Kurt Liston, and married to Jude, uh, she's a primary teacher. We have four children, uh, aged from 10 to 1 and uh, uh, they keep us uh, busy, obviously. Um, and uh, uh, previously I worked with UCCF, the Christian Unions, and then with uh, uh, Scripture Union for the last eight years, working with uh, um, groups and schools for children and young people, and uh, running camps and, uh, and other events for, um, for children and young people, uh, seeking to reach them with the, with the, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and in September last year, I started work at the, the Faith Mission Bible College, and I have to tell you, it is an absolute joy to be there. Um, it's uh, in, in Gilmerton, just in the south side of Edinburgh, and um, it's just such a privilege each morning to turn up at work and uh, pray with, with colleagues, with, uh, with Andrew's uh, sister Catherine, she works in the office, um, and, uh, and to pray for our students, and then to go uh, and uh, for, for college devotions with the students, they lead us in, uh, in, um, in devotions and we pray and worship together and then it's on to spend in the day studying and teaching the Bible and it's just absolutely wonderful and I absolutely love it and I even get to sit in David Reimer's old seat, which is like, <laughs> you know, uh, world authority uh, and uh, they've really scraped the barrel to uh, put me in that seat now but uh, it's a real privilege so um, a, you could join us at the college uh, um, tomorrow evening we have uh, a beginning of a new series of uh, public lectures so on Monday evenings we have um, during term time we have uh, public lectures I know it's a bit of a trek around uh, um, the motorway and the bypass to the, to the faith mission but we'd love to see you there Although if you find me painful to listen to this morning, I wouldn't come because uh, I'll be speaking on, uh, on prayer over the next three Monday evenings. It's half past seven and we're thinking about, well, the title is When You Pray, Say Father, the dynamics and delight of prayer. So if you'd like to, to join us for that, you'd be very welcome. And maybe some of you, some of you over the years have thought, you know, I would really like to take some time out and spend some time studying uh, theology more formally. Well, if you could spare a Tuesday, you could come and study at the college on a, a Tuesday. It's over two years, or a foundation certificate in uh, applied theology. So you'd study things like Old and New Testament. You'd study um, a, a, a courses like leadership and apologetics and evangelism, uh, a pastoral care. So if that's that would be of interest to you, do uh, take a look on our website. Um, I know you've not asked me to come here to advertise the college this morning, but <laughs> I would um, uh, ask you also to pray for us because we're not aiming just to be an educational institution. We want to, so encouraging just from Margaret this morning, hearing about how this, this church has, has grown over uh, recent years. Um, what we want to be a part of in the college is uh, the renewal of the church in this country, in, uh, in Scotland, in the whole UK and Ireland and uh, so do pray for us pray for us that God would send us uh, students who want to be trained to be involved in that renewal for evangelism for mission for for ministry um, so there we are uh, um, that's a little bit about me and what we do at the, the Faith Mission Bible College <clears throat> this morning we're looking at uh, the Gospel of John uh, so if you've got your Bible please turn to to chapter 13 and uh, we'll read verses 1 to 17. Um, uh, 
I'm reading from the, the English Standard Version. It's John uh, chapter 13 and verses 1 to 17. And before we, we read, let's come before God again in prayer together. <clears throat> Our Father, we thank you. We thank you that we have the privilege of gathering here together this morning to worship you, the true and living God, mm -hmm. and to look at your word together that you have revealed through your <clears throat> apostles and prophets that we would not just be wondering what you are like, but that we would truly know you. And so God, as we, we read these words now, and as we think on the meaning of them together, we ask that your spirit would be at work among us, that you would renew our hearts, renew our minds, that we would see again the great good news that God has come among us in the person of Jesus Christ mm. and made the way that human beings can have life as it was meant to be mm. and life eternal. So God, would you speak through your word this morning? We need you, we need you to speak to our hearts and we ask it in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Amen. So John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this, to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, supper when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it round his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped round him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterwards, you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my, my hands and my head. <coughs> Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had cleansed their feet, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done, for, done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So, amen. So, this is uh, one of the most famous passages of, uh, in, in the Gospels. Um, and I have to confess, that for many years this was one of my least favourite parts of, uh, of the Gospels because whenever, you, you know, the youth meetings and uh, student meetings, whenever this passage was read you knew what was coming next. Somebody was going to come out with a, a wash hand basin of soapy water, you were going to have to take off your socks and shoes, you were going to wash your feet and you were going to have to hope that you weren't going to spot your verrucas. Um, but when I I want to start with it, this uh, with a personal story, and I hope this is okay. Um, this is just a story of what uh, God did in, in my in my life that's been so important uh, to me. So, when I was in, in my early twenties, this passage of scripture became for me um, one of the most important in the Bible. Um, so I was walking. I was walk, It was late at night, and I was walking back to my student flat, and. Um, and I was, I was, I was trudging, uh, and I was feeling very guilty, feeling guilty, 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 because 
I had sinned yet again in a way that I'd done so many times before um, and I felt so far from God. I felt, how could you, how can I do that? How can I be like that? How am I still like that? Um, and, I, and I was praying, God, have I, is this once too many? Have I messed up one time too many? Um, how, and I was saying, how can, how can I know that you forgive Christians like me who mess up again and again on this same thing? And I, and I prayed, so I, I said, God, please show me a passage in the Bible that will reassure me that you can forgive me uh, for yet again for the same old sin. And I, I remember saying in my prayer, like, I know the prodigal son, you know, but, but that's about first coming to faith. And, you know, so that's no good. I need something else that, uh, so that will assure me that you can forgive me again. And what I, when I was praying, I remember this very clearly, I was, I was meaning in about two weeks time, after I'd had a good long time to wallow in self-pity and guilt at my sin. Um, but right there and then, in an instant, John 13 appeared in my mind. Um, I saw the, the page of scripture from my chewed up NIV Bible that was sitting back in my flat. Um, and uh, at the same time, this section of Jesus' conversation with the Apostle Peter and the meaning of it just became clear in my mind in an instant. Um, sometimes God answers our prayers like that. Often uh, he, um, he requires us to, <laughs> uh, to be a little more persistent. But the meaning just leapt into my mind and my heart in an instant, and I stopped there in the street, astounded. So Jesus says to Peter, you are clean, but you have to let me wash your feet. You have to let me wash your feet if you want to follow me. You are clean, I've made you mine, and that's it, that's once and for all. But if you want to follow me in your life, you have to let me, the Holy God, get down on my knees in front of you and wash off the muck that you have willingly walked through. You must let me forgive you. And I, I almost ran back to my flat to check if I had like made that up, and check whether or not that was actually in the Bible. Um, and, uh, and it was, and it is. And, um, and then I, I checked the commentaries and even the great Don Carson says that that is the meaning of the passage. So, so um, we're on, on solid ground. So what I want to do today is really spend um, our time unpacking what Jesus said to Peter and what that means for this whole foot washing thing. And that I'm sure many of us have been subjected to slash really blessed by, uh, which I've uh, delete as, uh, as you, as appropriate for you. So, um, if you're, new, if you're new to church or just investigating the Christian faith, um, whatever you think of my slightly odd story that I've begun with, um, this passage that we're looking at today um, is famous for Christians because in many ways it encapsulates what being a Christian is all about. So a little bit of context, up to this point in John's Gospel, Jesus has been saying incredible things. Um, like claiming that he's equal with God um, and uh, that he is the light of the world, more important than the sun, uh, that he is the only way to God. And he's been doing incredible things. He feeds 5,000 people with uh, a few loaves and fish. He walks on the water. He raises the dead. Uh, but they're afraid through it all when people say, you know, uh, are you, uh, have you come to be king of Israel? Um, his refrain through it all is that his hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. But then, in the previous chapter, in chapter 12, the whole narrative shifts. He gets anointed for burial. Um, he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, which is, uh, um, was prophesied that the humble king of Israel would do. And then some non-Jews come to Jesus, <coughs> and, uh, and then he says, my hour has come. Now, <coughs> my hour has come. He says, now I'm going to die for the sins of the whole world. And then God the Father actually speaks from it from, from heaven uh, and says, I will, I will glorify my name. And everyone hears it. It's quite a dramatic uh, um, passage <coughs> until uh, um, 
full uh, chapter, chapter 12. And then we come to chapter 13. And it begins, John begins, you see in verse 1, um, by telling us that this hour is this hour that is really on Jesus' mind. Uh, so so uh, look at verse 1. It's just before the Passover. So the Passover was the, the most important Jewish festival. It reminded them uh, of uh, the Exodus from thousands of years before. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt and uh, God told his people to make a sacrifice of a lamb and they were to put the blood above uh, their doorposts so that the angel of death would pass over the houses that had taken refuge under the blood of the lamb. Um, and uh, so that's the Passover. That's what John wants us, the readers, to have in mind as we read this. And earlier in the gospel, John tells us that Jesus had been called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus, we're meant to think, meant to realise is the one who fulfils the Passover festival. Just as the lambs died in the place of the firstborn sons of Israel, so Jesus would die for the sins of the whole world. That's what's on Jesus' mind here in John chapter 13. He knows that his hour or his time has come to depart out of this world. And it becomes even more obvious when you realise that this chapter is, is most probably the bits of the Last Supper uh, that the other Gospel writers didn't tell us about. Um, so if you compare this chapter, you could do this at home this afternoon, uh, with uh, Luke 22, um, where Jesus is also having supper with his disciples. Um, uh, the similarities are very strong. He says, this is my body broken uh, for you. This is my blood shed for you. Um, and one of, one of you will betray me. And so this is all to say, uh, Jesus knows he's about to die. He's about to give his life for his disciples' sin, for the sins and for the sins of the whole world in a matter of hours. So in a matter of hours, he will be tortured and beaten. Um, he will be ridiculed and spat on. He will be nailed to a cross. He will be suffocated to death. And he knows that one of his disciples is planning to betray him, to set the cogs in motion to make it all happen. So what would we do if we were Jesus? Verses 4 and 5. He got up, took off his outer garments, wrapped a towel around his waist, and began to wash his disciples' feet. And this was the job reserved for the lowest of the low, um, for, for the, the slave, if there was a, a, um, a slave on hand in a household. Um, and there's even an ancient text, apparently, um, that suggests that in Israel, they wouldn't even make a Jewish slave do it. It would have to be a Gentile slave, because this was the job of the lowest of the low. Um, for us, it would be odd, and although in youth groups it seems to be normal, it would be odd if you got the washing, the washing up bowl and uh, did this for friends at a dinner party. Um, but this is a normal thing. In first century Israel, people wore open sandals, and the roads were dirty and dusty, and there was some pretty disgusting stuff on the roads, uh, as you can imagine, um, uh, in the mix. So, like a slave, Jesus kneels down in front of each of his disciples and washes their feet. And when he, finish, when he finishes, he says this, verse 15, he says, you need to act like this. I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. So is that it? Jesus washes his disciples' feet, so Christians need to wash other people's feet. Or at least, Christians need to be willing to do the jobs that no one else wants to do. Stack the chairs. Hoover up after the meeting. Even be kind to people who are not very nice to us. Well, yes, like, that is what Jesus is. That's part of the, of the message of the passage. But there's so much more to it than that. And there's so much significance in what Jesus says in verse 12. If you look at verse 12, Jesus says, Do you understand what I've done to you? What I've done for you? In verse 7, he says, You don't understand what I'm doing now, but afterwards you will understand. And that's a big theme in John's Gospel. The disciples didn't really get what Jesus was doing and saying and, uh, until after he'd, he'd, he'd uh, died and risen again. Do you understand what I've done for you? It's obviously important that we do, isn't it? 
And here's what one Bible commentator says. In the foot washing, we have an acted parable of the Lord's humiliation unto death. This is an acted parable. It's not just about doing the jobs that no one else wants to do. It's about how we become the type of people who want to serve like Jesus served. About why we'd even want to become that type of person. And I think this statement uh, sums it up. This is my statement. If you want to wash other people's feet, if you want to be that type of person, then you have to let Jesus wash yours. If you want to be a servant of the living God and have his life in you, then you need to let the living God become your servant. If you want to wash other people's feet, you have to let Jesus wash yours. That, my friends, was the introduction. That's okay. So uh, what we're going to do is look at three main things in, in this passage under three statements that Jesus makes. So verse 10, the one who bathed does not need to wash, but is completely clean. Um, and we're going to put the ESV, the NIV says the whole body is clean. Um, second statement is in verse 8b, second half of verse 8, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And then thirdly, in verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So firstly, the one who, does, who has bathed does not need to wash but is completely clean. The one who has bathed does not need to wash, but is completely clean. What does Jesus mean by this? Well, this is really just a statement of the foundation of all Christian living. And I'm sure most of us know this well, but how fully do we live in the freedom of it? So look at this conversation, Jesus' conversation with Peter in verses eight to, to 10. Jesus comes to, to Peter with the basin and the towel, and Peter says to him, No way, no way, Lord, you will never wash my feet. You are, you, you're something, you're the Messiah, you're a rabbi, and Peter thinks, maybe even the Messiah. Um, I should be washing your feet. But Jesus says to him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now, that is something I say to my children if they refuse to get into the bath. But uh, um, I, I quite enjoy just uh, giving them Bible quotes that are usually misapplied in the context. Um, it's quite fun, good for scripture memory. Um, but uh, Peter responds, well, give me a bath then. Um, and these are the words from Jesus to Peter. The one who is bathed does not need to wash, but is completely clean. So do you see how this can't just be about acts of service? In this passage the fact that Jesus washes his disciples when his mind is full of the fact that he's about to go to the cross to die for the sins of the world it makes it very clear that this is deeply symbolic so Jesus says to Peter your head and your hands are clean you've already had a bath so what does that mean he says the same thing in uh, chapter 15 and verse 3 just a few pages on already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you and this is simply the heart of the gospel the good news that the Christian faith is all about. That because of Jesus' death on the cross, we can be forgiven all of our sin. Past and present and future. So later in, in the Bible, the Apostle Paul puts it like this in his letter to Titus. When the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Or Colossians 1.22, Paul again says, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. These uh, famous old words express it better than I could. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. 
So this is it. This is the, the ground of all our faith and all our obedience to Jesus. This is what he has done for us on the cross. On the cross, the eternal Son of God became, who had become a man, bore the wrath of God against the sin of man in our place. Jesus was punished for our sin, so we have nothing to fear from God. If we've trusted in Jesus, when he looks on us, God does not see our sin. He sees his son's righteousness, his perfect sinlessness. So that's why Jesus can say that people like Peter are people like us. You are clean in my eyes. And so for us, the simple act of turning away from the sin in our lives and turning to Jesus as Lord, saying, sorry, and I trust you. That is all it takes for the true and living God to look on us and say, clean, pure, and holy. All of it. Every wrong thing you've ever said, thought, or done, and every wrong thing that you will ever do, gone forever. The gospel is really that good. Through simply receiving Jesus as Lord, he makes us completely clean in the sight of the only one who truly matters, the true and living God. So if you're a Christian, no matter what last week or last year involved, that is your standing before the true and living God. And if you're not a Christian, or if you're not sure, or you wouldn't uh, consider yourself a Christian yet, well, this is the message of the Christian faith. The God of the universe <clears throat> is actually there. So many people in our culture think he might be there. Well, he, the message of the Christian faith is that he is there and he's not silent and literally billions of people know him personally and are known by him. The God of the universe wants to know us. And even, even though he is unimaginably far above us in greatness and impurity and holiness, he has made a way for us not just to become his servants, but to become his dearly loved children forever. Our culture um, is very confident that it knows what's good and what's true and how we should live. And yet, you look at the mess, the mess in so many people's lives. What if we were actually missing out on what human life is really meant to be about. I remember a conversation with one of my flatmates at university, he was called Craig, um, and uh, he was doing the dishes in our tiny little kitchen, and uh, he was giving me lots of reasons why he didn't believe in God. He just kept listing them off, and, uh, and um, after a while, he said to me, you've got an answer for everything, haven't you? <laughs> I said, well, look, you know, <laughs> that might be because there are these aren't good <laughs> reasons not to believe. And then he said to me, look, the fact of the matter is, the only way I will believe in this God is if he would come down and show himself to us. And he thought that was a good point. And I said to him, oh, you ever heard of like Christmas? You ever heard of Jesus? That is the whole point. The whole point is, God has not left us wondering, needing to wonder. He has shown himself to us in the person of Jesus. And who he is and what he offers to us is utterly wonderful. So all we need to do to receive God's life in us is to pray, is to turn to him and ask for forgiveness. Uh, ask forgiveness for acting like he's not there and ask him to be Lord of our lives. And he will do the rest. So... The one who has bathed is completely clean. But secondly, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Because there's a problem, isn't there, right? Uh, Christians still sin. We know this well. We all still sin. We all still mess up. Even the most mature and godly Christian still uh, has selfishness and pride and all kinds of uncleanness that runs through their mind and their life every day. Um, that was my problem as I, I walked along the road that late that, that evening, feeling guilty, guilty, guilty. I knew that my status before God was meant to be clean, pure and holy in his sight, but I was worried that I'd done something to jeopardise that. 
that maybe I'd sinned one time too many. Maybe I was going to have to wait a few days until God had calmed down in his anger towards me. Maybe I should go and wash the people's feet. Or um, you know, maybe that would pay for my sin and, and make him love me again. But Jesus' words in these, this verse blow that kind of religion right out of the water. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Because what Jesus is saying to Peter is, yes, you are clean and holy in my sight because of what I'm about to do for you on the cross, but you're going to mess up again and again and again and again. And I want you to know that there is nothing you can do to earn my forgiveness. And so the point is this. We don't deal with our continuing sin as Christians by trying harder or trying to pay God back or going through some kind of penance. That's not how it works. We deal with it by letting Jesus wash us. The very first sin gives us a picture um, that shows us what we are all really like. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what did they do? They hide from God and then they try and make for themselves some clothing to cover up their shame. By their own efforts, they make a covering for themselves. Um, and I don't know about you, but um, there are plenty of times in my life when I feel ashamed about my behaviour, and, and it's even more so when it comes to uh, my thoughts, um, the, the thoughts that pass through my mind. And then I read God's Word, and I see this beautiful, full to overflowing life of loving kindness that God says is his standard. And I fall way short of that daily. How does God want us to respond to the, to the sin, to the shame that continues in our lives, even after we've become Christians? Cut it out? Try harder? Well, that is part of it. Jesus says, cut off the, eye, uh, cut off the hand, pluck out the eye that causes you, you to sin, Jesus said, using hyperbole. He doesn't intend for his actions to do that. Um, so cut it out. Is certainly part of it but the Bible also makes it clear that the transformation begins on the inside it begins with our hearts our desires so transformation happens when we get gripped by a love for God and for his ways and the way we get gripped by God is when we realize that how Jesus wants to deal with our sin and shame is by letting him in love and tenderness, kneel in front of you and wash the dirt from your feet that you've willingly walked through. Last week, last year, this morning, he is the judge of the whole earth. He is pure and holy, and yet he bore the judgment in our place. So he wants us to let him wash us to let him forgive us, to let him love us again. And when we do, we find our hearts are warmed to love him again. And the, the desire uh, to cut out sin and to make every effort to add to our faith, godliness and self-control and restoring that relationship and, and praying for that, that person rather than resenting them. That is what begins to grow in us when we realise and experience God's forgiveness again. God's humbling of himself before us to wash our feet. We even get, we even get the, uh, the, the motivation to do the dirty job that nobody else wants to do. And we know that God has loved us like that. <coughs> so if, you're, if, if that's relevant to you, if you're dealing with shame today, through this passage of scripture, Jesus says to you, let me bear the shame in your place. Let me kneel in front of you and wash you. Let me forgive you. Let me love you. Otherwise, you can have no part with me. And we know the lengths that he went to to make us a part of him. The last thing is, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So when Jesus had washed their feet, he put on his outward garments and re resumed his place. And he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you. Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. 
If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Verse 17. If you do these things, blessed are you if you do them. So Jesus says, this wasn't just for show. I really, I really actually do want you to treat each other like I have treated you. Yes, the foot washing is an active parable of forgiveness, but Jesus does actually want his disciples to have this attitude, this humility. The foot washing represents every act of love where we put the needs of others before our own. So if we're going to follow Jesus now, he calls us to the same humility, the same sacrificial love that he showed here. Christians really are meant to be radically different. And it's, but it's not meant to be drudging. So verse 17, Jesus says, we are blessed if we treat others like this. John 10, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is part of what life in all its fullness looks like. To have a love for God that overflows from us in service to others. That we're not just like constantly frustrated and annoyed and constantly um, needing others to make space for us. No, God has made space for us and given us all that we need. And when we receive from him, his life can actually flow through us. His love can actually flow, flow through us. So when we know the life-changing and always undeserved mercy and love of God in our lives, that's the power to live in his ways. The Apostle John says this in his letter. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his, his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So it's about humility. And it is astonishing to think that the God of the universe is humble. So look at, look at verse 3. Jesus knew who he was. John says, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he come from God the Father and was going back to God the Father because he knew that he was the eternal Son of God with all power in the universe at his disposal. Because of that, he was able to give himself for others. So what Jesus shows us is that real strength leads to humility and serving of others because when we're full we're strong we don't need others to serve our needs to make us feel good about ourselves to feel in control when we're full of god's love and secure in his grace we're free to love and serve others the um preacher and writer tim keller called this the blessed habit of self-forgetfulness that's humility so full of god's love that we can be focused on others and their needs and not our, our own. Our culture, as we all know, just militates against this. It says it's all about us. And you hear it all the time on, on TV. I actually uh, have not watched TV for about two years, but I do watch a lot of news on YouTube. Um, apart from Gladiators, just the, <laughs> my kids love Gladiators, so I was loving about that last night. Um, but we hear this all the time. It's time I stop thinking about everyone else and focused on myself. And we're surrounded by materialism and consumerism. So I, I was never interested in cars. And then I moved house uh, to Kirk Liston and I had to drive to work through Edinburgh's luxury car village. And every day I would pass by the Lexus and, and Mercedes and BMW garages. And they would have these adverts on the side of the car saying, own deposit only 5,000 5, pounds and then more than your mortgage a month. <laughs> like uh, somehow uh, it, that got under my skin I was like oh I really need that Mercedes um, even though I would then be on the street with nothing uh, um, and our young people are told your purpose in life is to identify yourself by your feelings and express them fully the Bible says that God made us and our purpose in life is to glorify him and enjoy him forever. The culture says be true to yourself and your feelings and your needs and your desires and have that thing. Put yourself first. Jesus says deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world 
yet loses or forfeits himself. I'll say this, I think our culture is calling people to be pathetic. It's so weak to be focused on my needs all the time. And the offer of the gospel is that all of our needs can be met in the overflowing fountain of love that is the true and living God. And so what, what Jesus calls us to is to be heroic. It's to be like, you should really be doing that thing, but I'm going to do it. Because I don't need, I don't need you to acknowledge my needs. Because I have the strength and power of the true and living God at work in me. That is really what God can do in us if we turn to him and rely on him. So Jesus doesn't say these things because Christianity is meant to be drudgery. He says them because he wants us to truly find ourselves. Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father, Jesus says. This is what God himself is like. He washes feet, even the feet of the one who would betray him. And we are made in his image. So to love like this is what it means to be fully human. Because of our sinful hearts, we cannot do it on our own. And that's why if you want Jesus' life at work in you, if you want to live through him, if you want to wash other people's feet, you have to let Jesus wash your feet. You have to let the Holy Son of God wash away the sin that will always be there come to him daily and receive again God's yes over you pure and holy blameless in my sight you are a child of the living God he sings songs of joy over you when you wake up in the morning before you've done anything good or evil or even if you had a really evil dream he sings songs of joy over you because his love for you is not based on anything that you do and that you need to daily we need to daily let him love us like that we need his forgiveness we need to know that we have it today. We need to know, even if we mess up a thousand times, we have it. And it's not because of our goodness, it's because of his grace. It's not about our work for him. It's about his finished work for us on the cross. So, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest news that anyone has ever heard. And it's not only, not only good news, it is true. And it's not only true... But it works. So let's be people who have the true and living God at work in us and through us, that others might know his life and eternal life. Let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, we thank you for the incredible message of the gospel. It is hard for us to believe, God, that you could be so gracious to us. Mm -hmm. We are far more comfortable with setting ourselves a new law that we try to keep in order to please you. But you say to us, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags in your sight. There is nothing that we can do to justify ourselves to you. The holy God. And yet, that is not what you ask of us. What you ask of us is that we let you wash us. Mm -hmm. We let the blood of Jesus shed on the cross be effective for our sins once and for all and every day. And so God, we pray, almighty God, our Father, we <coughs> pray that your life would be at work in us, that Jesus life would be at work in us, that your spirit would fill us and shape us and empower us and make us those who are lights in this dark world through our actions and through our words. And all of this we pray mm. in the, the strong name, the powerful name, the merciful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Mm.